We've spent most of our lives making music in bedsits. We'd get all that gear out to play or record something, then have to put it all away again when we wanted the living space back. When we finally moved out of the city and got a bit more space, and a whole room we could dedicate to our music, we decided to soundproof it, both for our benefit and for our immediate neighbours. Before we go any further, I'd better clarify the difference between soundproofing and sound treatment. Soundproofing aims to block any sound coming into or out of a room. Sound treatment is about eliminating extraneous frequencies from your room to give you a cleaner, more dead sound when recording and prevent those sound reflections from playing tricks on your ears when mixing. They are two completely different sciences, and yes, they go deep enough to be called sciences. Now, when I say soundproof, there is only so much one can do to block noise coming in or out of a terraced house, or any property connected to others. Sound doesn't just travel through the air, but through every solid object connecting the properties. Walls, joists, floors. The only way to have a truly soundproof room is to have a disconnected floating room inside a bigger room, and the deeper the gap between the two, the better. This just isn't realistic for most people. Neither are the prices of professional soundproofing. We were looking at over £10,000, and this was back in 2016. So we did some research, and after watching two short videos from British Gypsum, we realized we could do it ourselves. Our studio has double thickness brick wall on one side through which we hear nothing, but the other wall is paper thin, as our house was once part of the house on that side. There was also a lot of base leakage through the joists and the floor. So we decided to soundproof the problem wall and install a floating floor. We worked out what we need in what quantities based on those two videos from British Gypsum and ordered our supplies in. First, we needed to get the floorboards up and fill between the joists with rock wool. It's important to use PPE when handling rock wool as the fibres that come off of it are very fine and bad for your skin and lungs. Our house is very old and we discovered years of ad hoc plumbing below the floor a snaking system of brown plastic tubes threaded all around the room. We had an incident with these pipes, which we didn't capture on film. Suffice to say, be very, very careful when screwing into a floor with a lot of pipes or cabling below the surface. The next stage was to place the Jip Frame SI floor channel gently on each joist, with Jip Rock planks sitting on each lip between each joist. We then laid the floorboards on top of this structure and screwed them into the jip frame floor channel edges below. There are no screws connecting this floor to the joists. It just floats on top of them. We had to upgrade our N91 masks to proper 3M half-mask respirators to protect us from the ultra-fine plaster dust which billowed into the room every time we cut a board to size. Working on the floor meant we were always on our knees, so knee pads were indispensable. The work was hard and sweaty, and we finished each day very sore. With the floor completed, we were ready for stage two, the wall. The electricians installed the sockets for this room in the floor, which made our job slightly easier. We didn't have to cut and measure special keyholes for the sockets in the new wall. First, we put the Jipframe standard channel 50 FEC 50 around the edge of the wall and sealed the gaps with silicon. The more depth you can add between the original wall and the new one, the better for soundproofing. But we didn't want to sacrifice any more space than we had to in this room, so we kept it fairly shallow. The next part was so labour intensive, I have no footage of us doing it. So here's the British Gypsum man. First, putting the 48i50 studs along the frame at 600mm intervals. Then, placing rock wall between them. And lastly, fixing the incredibly heavy Jiprock sound block plasterboard to the frame. Each sheet of this stuff weighed nearly 50 kilos and needed to be cut to size. It's definitely a two-person job. When the wall was complete, we skimmed over the screws and the dipped edge with some two-prey and voila! 
The whole job took a matter of weeks and cost only about £1,300 in materials. It was a very tough job though, made more difficult by our old house with its mad plumbing and jigsaw of oddly shaped floorboards, so if you can afford professionals, go for it. However, if you're on a budget, it can be done between you and a friend. The improvement was drastic. We hear no sound at all from next door through this room and have never had a complaint about our own noise, and it can get loud in there. Though we can still hear bass coming through to the room below, it has improved massively and no longer sounds like the ceiling is going to fall in on your head. Now that's all well and good if you have the time and money to spare, but what if you don't have upwards of £1,300 for soundproofing? What can you do? Well, in terms of soundproofing, not a lot. However, there is plenty you can do to treat a room to sound better with absorption, diffusion, bass traps and resonators. Untreated rooms give an uneven frequency response. This basically means you can't hear your mix accurately because the room shape might be exaggerating certain frequencies. This can give you a poor mix that will sound wildly different in different spaces. Also, any acoustic recordings you make in an untreated space will record the audio thumbprint of the unique resonant frequencies in that room. This also works the other way around. If you have a neutral recording, you can apply reverb effects from specific places like halls, churches or bathrooms. We generally want a dead sound to anything we record so that we can add effects during production. But there's plenty to be said for recording a live feeling room to capture a lo-fi or acoustic vibe. Now, you don't need to turn your room into a padded cell or egg carton nightmare to treat it. Absorption is the most popular way to reduce reflective sound in a room, and it will take care of most of the high frequencies. Fabrics and furniture are your friends. Fill the room with dense objects like full bookshelves or a clothes rail along the wall. Lay some cheap rugs on the floor. When recording, draw the curtains and hang a duvet over them to absorb outside noise and deaden the room. You could even go as far as propping a mattress against a wall. If you have a little budget, you could try some strategically placed acoustic foam, but you'll get far better results with acoustic panels, which absorb more frequencies. Acoustic panels are essentially a light wooden frame filled with dense rock wool and covered in fabric, designed to look unobtrusive and absorb as much sound in as little space as possible. If you can't afford to buy acoustic panels new and you're a bit handy, you could make your own for much less. If you're not that handy, you could try stuffing the back of a large cheap art canvas with rock wool and stretch an old sheet taut over the whole thing with a staple gun. Seal that sheet tight though because you don't want those rock wool fibers loose in your room. Acoustic panels should be placed at key points of reflection based on your speaker position. Speaker position is another topic, but generally speaking, you want them to be set at ear level, on stands, not on a desk, which causes more reflections, in an equilateral triangle with your head in the middle. Diffusers are designed to scatter sound waves so that they don't bounce back uniformly, causing disorienting echoes. Different designs can reduce different frequencies. Do not use egg cartons or bubble wrap or any other thin, bumpy, flammable materials. Any sound improvement will be minimal, and more importantly, they're a huge fire hazard. These materials tend to have a far too regular pattern to produce any form of useful diffusion. The most common DIY design is the Skyline diffuser, made of varying heights of blocks of wood, though these can be very heavy. Alternatively, you could try the lighter, broad frequency reflecting Arkin Lean Fuser design. Next, we need to trap the bass. Why? The bass coming out of our speakers typically has a wavelength that's longer than most rooms. This creates a buildup of low frequency energy at the corners and walls of the rooms called standing waves. Standing waves make it very hard to mix audio. The conventional way to deal with this is to install bass traps in each corner of the room. But if you can't afford these, try putting an armchair in the corner of the room or bring in a sofa. Lastly, if you want to get really technical, you can eliminate specific frequencies, usually bass, with Helmholtz resonators. One of the most common uses for Helmholtz resonators is as mufflers for internal combustion engines. 
the fundamental design is an enclosure or cavity in which there is a vent or a port. The dimensions of the cavity and the port determine the resonant frequency of the resonator. Things get quite technical here, but they are a lightweight and compact way of dealing with bass frequency issues in a small space. Absorption, diffusion, traps and resonators, just one of these things might not change the sound of your room very much, but in combination, you should start to get a better, deader sound for recording and mixing. If all of this sounds like too much just to be able to record and mix your music, there are alternatives. For recording, take the money you would have spent on treatment and buy a decent portable vocal booth. Make a duvet tent over it if you're still catching any resonance in your recording. We use this one from GIK Acoustics. For mixing, spend as much as you can afford on a decent, flat set of mixing headphones, like the Sennheiser HD600s or HD650s. Or just pay someone else to mix your audio. If you do decide to mix on headphones only, make sure to listen to your mix in as many different situations as possible. Different speakers, different headphones, different sources, even in cars. Don't make changes to your mix depending on just one listening environment, but on all of them. You want it to sound as consistent as possible for all listeners. Soundproofing and treatment are incredibly complex, but these techniques combined should help you get a better sound for your music at a budget you can afford.